So I remember a time I was grade six and um, <clears throat> I, w I was playing for our school soccer team. And uh, I've always played the position of defender. And I remember going to this tournament and I was uh, the, the, the right wing, the one on the, on the right side, so the right back. And there was uh, the central defender who was uh, kind of taking care of all of us, coordinating the, the, the defense. And we're playing this long tournament. We start at 7 in the morning, the ones that, that are always at SKW, and we played till about 3. But at about 1 o'clock, the, 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 the defender that was coordinating everything, the, the, the main guy, the central defender, he pulled his hamstring really badly. And the coach uh, pu pulled us all out between one, of, uh, between one game and another and said, okay, Rico, it's your job now. You are gonna, you're, you're the head of defense now. You are the main defender. You need to coordinate defense. We had never practiced this, right? So I'm, I'm, I'm standing there, I'm wondering, what am I gonna do? What am I gonna do? And our coach at that time, Mr. Simenda, just said to me, don't worry, I'll be on this side, I'll shout out what you must do. And Mr. Mr. Simenda was, 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 was smart in that he knew that me and the other defender were very different, right? He was, he was very fast, he was, a lean, fit guy, and I was the muscle. <laughs> so I was there because he saw that maybe it was some pent-up aggression from somewhere, but when we would play and, and I would start to get frustrated, I would start to body all of, all of the kids. And so he would just tell me, body that guy, body that one, body that one, body that one. Till later in the day, I got, I got uh, a bit too confident uh, I got one yellow card in one game, and then our final game, I got a red card and I was off because I was so confident now. Now a slide tackling, doing things I'd never done before. But <clears throat> I was put in this position, in a position I wasn't ready for, in a position that Mr. Simenda knew I could do, and he pushed me uh, to, to be a better defender. In our story today, we find Joshua in the same place. It's, it, Deviate actually preached my whole sermon. I don't know how I'm going to follow that up. But in our, in our passage today, and, and, and it's, it's Joshua chapter 1, and we're going to go from verse 1 to, to 9. This is our main passage, and we're reading from the NIV. Um, but um, we'll read the passage, and then we go into some background. So, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to, to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' aid, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then, you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I am about to give to them, to the Israelites. I will give you every place where you set your foot, as I promised Moses. Your territory will extend from the desert of Lebanon and from the great river, the Euphrates, all, all the Hittite country to the Midianite Sea in the west. No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and courageous because I will lead, because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to them, to their ancestors to give them. Again, he says, be strong and courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my, so my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. Keep this book of, of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Now just some, some background. Uh, before this, the, the Israelites had been promised, they should have already been in the promised land 40 years ago. Uh, but <clears throat> 40 years back, they sent a, a group of, of, of men, te, uh, 12 men, to go into the land, to go and scout, to go and see what it's about, to go and see if it's really the land flowing with milk and honey like God had promised. So 12 spies go in. 
and they come back. And two spies, Joshua being one of them and another one being Caleb, he says, listen, we can, this place is really what was said. Like the fruit is huge. It's really the place flowing with milk and honey. I don't know, like I, I don't have a picture in my mind, but I just know that's delicious. All right? He says, this is the place. This is, this is the land. This is the good place God has told us about. This has exceeded our expectations. They're saying, let's go, let's take it, because the Lord is with us. The other ten spies say, say this in Numbers uh, 13, verse 31 to 33. It says, but the men who had gone up with him said, we can't attack those people. They are stronger than we are. And they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land. They said, the land we explored devours those living in it. All the people there are of great size. We saw Nephilim, uh, the descendants of Anna, come from Nephilim. We seem like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and we look the same to them. They're saying these people are huge. Now, now it, it talks about Nephilim, and, and, and these were, were people from, if you go back to Genesis, um, they, were, they were called heroes, men, men of strength. They were known for, for their battle exploits. These were very dangerous people. And they said, look at these people. These, these ten spies are freaked out. They don't know what to do, and they're telling the people, listen, I don't know what God thought we were going to do here, but we need to go back. In the very next chapter, then, the people start to complain to Moses and Aaron. They say, why did you bring us out here? You brought us, you took us out of Egypt to come here and be killed by these giants. Why have you done this to us? And God says to Moses, he speaks to Moses and says, I'm about to destroy these people. And Moses says to God, but, but God, if, if, if you destroy them, the Egyptians will hear about it. And they won't know your greatness. Because God, God already knew this. And then he said to them, they won't be one person from this generation. They will not be one person who, who, who stood in fear and doubted me that will enter the promised land. He says, you will wander 40 years, one year for each day of the exploration mission. And he says, only those who trusted, they will cross over into the promised land. At this point, Moses is, is, is the one who's communicating. So, so, so Joshua is, is there. In the beginning of the chapter, it describes him as Moses' aide, his, his helper. But... At this point, Moses is the leader. He's the one who hears, who communicates with God. He has the close relationship with God. If you read in, in Exodus, when Moses came down from, 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 from the mountain with the Ten Commandments, he says he shone of, of, with glory because he was that close to God. There is, there's another part where uh, God puts him in, in, in this rock face and then, and then turns his back and... and, and and Moses sees the back of God. And that's where Moses says, the Lord, the Lord, gracious and compassionate. Where he describes this in Psalm 40, 34, where he describes the character of God. Being in this place of closeness and understanding who God is. But Joshua was not in this place. Joshua merely heard what Moses said. And then, and then got the message. And then did what he was supposed to do. So Moses was the one who was hearing Joshua did not have that close relationship with God. And I think uh, about how easy it is as believers to fall into the same thing. To almost live under and through other believers. It happens. It happens in, in, in different ways. Sometimes there's, there's, there's a, a particular pastor that we listen to. Maybe it's John Piper and everything that he says is law. And that's the person that you follow. Maybe it's someone here at church. Maybe it's your parent or parents. Maybe it's your spouse. Maybe it's a sibling, a friend. Anyone who is following God with all their heart. And it's easy for us to be, because we're part of a community, to kind of live vicariously through other people. To be like, okay, no, we'll just, we'll just follow them. I don't need to have... A, a personal pursuit. I don't need to personally pursue God. I can just follow along. I'll just do what they're doing. I'll just tag along with them. 
And God desires to speak to each and every one of us personally. He desires to, for us to have this closeness that Moses here has with God. He wants us to know what his character is like. He wants us to know what purpose he's given us. But you know, it's, 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 easy, it's easy to follow, to follow other people, to follow someone else who has done the hard work of agonizing before God and, and pouring, pouring uh, through scripture and, and praying to find out what God's will is. And it's easy for us to just kind of sit back and go, no, 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 we'll just, we'll just follow them. They've, they've got the way, I'm just behind them. But then Moses, Moses was, was, was this picture for, for, for Israel, and I'm sure for Joshua, he looked up to Moses. This is the guy to listen to. And he expected to enter the promised land with Moses. But then Moses messed up. So at, at some point, uh, the Israelites had come to an area and they, they, there wasn't water, and the Israelites had fallen into this habit of every time something was lacking, they would grumble against God. They say, God brought us out here to die of thirst. And this has hap had happened before, and, and God had told Moses before that to, to strike a rock, and then with, with a staff, and water came out. And this time God said to him, speak to the rock, and water will come out. And Moses comes in anger, and he strikes the rock. And he says, must we give you this water? And he's talking about him and Aaron. And in that, in that moment, it looked to the Israelites that like this was the work of Moses and not the work of God. And God said to him, you're not going to enter the promised land. It says in, in Deuteronomy 34 verse 4 and then verse 7, it says, Then the Lord said to him, and they're on the edge of the promised land, this is the land I promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob when I said I will give it to your descendants. I have let you see it with your eyes, but you will not cross over into it. I just see Moses standing there right at the border with tears in his eyes, thinking if I had just obeyed God in that moment, if I didn't let my pride get the better of me, I could cross over into this land. Then in verse 7, it says that Moses was 120 years old when he died. Yet his eyes were not weak, nor his strength gone. So he had, he had the strength of youth. He was fine. But God said, you're not crossing over into this land. And I can, remember, I can imagine now Joshua, as, he's, as, as Moses is talking to him, wondering, what am I going to do? You're the one we've always followed. You're the one who's told us what God has, has told us to do. And at the beginning of this chapter, God starts by telling Joshua that Moses is dead. The one that used to communicate to me, the one that had a close relationship with me is dead. It's no longer Moses' mission. It's now your mission. It's not Moses' responsibility, it's your responsibility. God is saying to Joshua, it's me and you now. And God tells Joshua, continues, and he says, what he promised to Israel, the promised land. This is the land that I'll give you. I'll be faithful in what I said. And then he says, in verse 5, no one will be able to stand against you because I will be with you the same way I was with Moses. He's reassuring him. He's saying, I'm the same God. I don't, I, I, I'm not going to show preference to Moses. I will be with you the exact same way. God is calling Joshua into a relationship of trust with him. I'm saying, this is our time. Let's move forward now. Trust me. I'll be faithful the same way I was with Moses. I will perform the great miracles. I will protect you from people. At this point, the Israelites had, ha they had a few battles with a few of the nations there. Some of the Amorites and the Midianites who had come, who are also great nations, and God had been faithful before. But now as they're stepping in for, for, for the real conquest now, stepping out, stepping into the land to fight the battle, he's saying, I will be faithful 
the same way I was before. And God is, God is calling us to the same thing. Saying, I want personal relationship with you. I want for us to grow in intimacy like that. See, he wants to speak directly to us. When, when Jesus died, we were given direct access to God. It says on, on, on the day of his crucifixion, when he died, there's, there's a veil that, 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 that separates the holy place from the holy of holies. And that veil was torn, saying that you now have access through me to that place that the high priest could only go once a year. After making a sacrifice for his own sins, to make a sacrifice for all the people. He can only be in the presence of God that one day. And now, because that veil is torn, Jesus is saying, through me, you have direct access to the Father. Israel didn't need a priest anymore. We don't need a priest anymore because we are called a royal priesthood. See, in the Old Testament, God spoke to the priests and, and the prophets, and they relayed the message onto the Israelites. They had direct access to God, and, and, and God would, would, would um, fill them with the Holy Spirit. Or not fill them, but the Holy Spirit would come upon them for a certain task and a certain time. But as believers, we have that direct access, and we have the Holy Spirit every second of every day. He's inviting every one of us to grow in him, each of us, individually. See, we're the, we're the body of Christ. We're this team, we're, we're, we're this, this machine with moving parts, every part doing its own thing. And, and, and uh, we've heard things like there's no I in team. And in a team, if you have one person that, that is not doing things right, the whole team is pulled down. And it's the same for us. God has called us to, to be his church, to be his people, to go out and, 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 and um, spread his message, his truth, to live like him, to draw people to him. But he's calling every single one of us. Because this is the thing. All of us have different backgrounds. We're in different jobs, different schools, different cultures. I will reach a certain group of people, and Hunga will reach another group of people, and Ziggy will reach another group of people. Every single one of us has a specific set of people we can reach better than anyone else in this church. We're called to be God's team to go forward. But that, that means that every single one of us needs to hear specifically and directly from God. I'm not going to hear what Hunga, I'm not going to hear how I'm supposed to speak or how Hunga is supposed to speak to the people he's interacting with. That's something he must hear from God. That's something he must ask God every morning. Say, God, how do I reach out to the people you've called me to? How am I supposed to live? How do I live in my family? How do I, how do I, how do I speak? How do I act around my friends? God mold me, and, and he's inviting each and every one of us first to experience him personally and individually, and experience his goodness. See, Moses could, could easily say to the Israelites that God is faithful and God is true because he knew who God was. When we meet Moses in the beginning, he, he's terrified. He flees Egypt. When God is sending him to go and speak to Pharaoh, he says, I can't speak. I'm too nervous. I, I can't speak well. Maybe get someone else. Now Moses consistently is telling the Israelites that your God is faithful. With confidence, he leads them. See, there's a huge difference, and, and, and this is something that, that I was told. I remember when I, when I first became a believer, I was with this, uh, this family um, who were the, the church librarians at, at this church, Calvary Chapel in Cape Town, and I just kind of followed whatever they did. And I remember going home the first holiday as a believer, and him saying, now you're going to have to trust who God is for yourself. Because I told them, I know that the family members that I want to share Christ with, I don't know how I'm going to go back, how I'm supposed to live, how I'm supposed to act. And he says, God will guide you. 
And he says, don't you want to experience that for yourself? I remember hearing all these testimonies from different people in church and thinking, wow, that's amazing. And feeling good about it and going home and then forgetting about it. This guy Jonathan was saying to me now, this is your chance now to taste and see how good God is. See, there's a big difference between hearing about someone wonderful. Let me hear from the people who are married. There's a big difference between hearing about this wonderful, fantastic person and then getting to know them, living with them, sharing life with them. There's a huge difference between hearing about how amazing someone is and, and sharing these jokes. I, I don't know if, if Landula is here, but Landula has, has uh, this, uh, this, this laugh, right? It's one of the best laughs you'll ever hear. It's one of those that you feel sorry for the person that he's laughing at. But you can't help but laugh with him. Now, many people here will probably have heard his laugh. But it's nothing like, hearing his laugh is nothing like being there and laughing with him. And, and, and laughing like crazy. See, God is saying he's inviting you and me. He's saying, I'm wonderful. Don't you want to find that out for yourself? He's saying, I love you and I want to be your perfect father. Don't you want to find that out for yourself? He's saying, I'm your perfect provider. Will you not come and find that out for yourself? I'll be your comforter in times of sorrow. Won't you find that out for yourself? I'll be faithful in times of tri trial and trouble. Don't you want to find that out for yourself? First Peter 2 verse 9 says this, You're a chosen people, a royal priesthood, and a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. It says that we're royal priesthood, direct access to God, a holy nation set apart, God's special possession. We are his but we, he also says something here that says we have purpose. What's the thing that people search for above all else? I, I, I see this with, with, with so many people who have strived to get money and power and fame and, and get to the top of their game. And then when they've got all this search for purpose, what am I here for? What am I supposed to do? There must be more to life than this. And he says, this is what we're supposed to do, to declare his praises. We are made to reflect his glory. We're given divine purpose. And that's, that's an amazing thing. I think it's great that we're saved, but it's also amazing that every single day I have a mission. I have something to do. Uh, one, of, one of the most depressing things is, is, is um, sitting and having nothing to do every single day. Right? It's difficult because you, you fall into this life of hopelessness, not because things are hopeless, but because we're lacking purpose. And here is one of the greatest gifts that we have, is purpose in Christ. At the end of, of, of Jesus' life here on, here on earth, after he's resurrected and he's about to leave he says this to the disciples, and we all know this, the Great Commission. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. And the disciples are in the same place Joshua was. Because till this point, they just kind of been following Jesus, listening to him, he would give them instructions and they would follow. But now Jesus was saying, the same way it was my mission, the same way I agonized before the Father daily, it's your mission now. It's not you following along with me or walking behind me. Now you're doing the mission. They used to walk behind Jesus, used to help him. I think of them handing out the, 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 the fish and, 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 the, and the bread but now it's on them. Now they must go out and make disciples of all nations. 
You're saying this to a group of people who are not theologically trained. They, they are not qualified for this. But he says the same thing that God says to Joshua. I will be with you always to the end of the age. And there's an instance where before that, early in Matthew, where Jesus had sent out the disciples to go and preach the gospel and to, to, to heal those who were sick and to cast out demons. But then he told them something. He says, he said that there would be people who would reject you. And he said, shake, shake the dust off your feet as a sign. But then he also said something else. He says, I didn't come to bring peace. My message is not one that will go over well with many people. He says, I came to bring the sword. Which is, is not Jesus being violent, but he's saying, this message will offend people so much that you will be hated. He says, your enemies will be those that come from your own house. Your fathers, your mothers, your siblings. You can go over to our friends, our colleagues. This message of Christ, this life that we've been called to live, is one that is fraught with danger. That is something that is promised. I can imagine as, as Joshua is going over into this land, he's thinking about this. He's thinking about these giants that they're about to, to, to fight. Thinking about fighting men that have been training since they were tiny. Warriors from birth. He's thinking about this danger. He's looking at himself thinking, can we do this? And that's what it's like to be a believer. It is not an easy task. It is not. Those that say that following Christ is easy, they either have not experienced it or they're trying to sell something else. We are promised hardship and trouble. But then there's a, a, a beautiful picture and, and, and throughout the scripture, the, it, the, 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 the walk with Jesus is... is is um, painted as, as a race or as a fight. There's a lot of military language in the scripture. And, and I think of, of how Romans would go out and they would fight these wars. And they'd fight against the, 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 the nations that opposed them. Now, if, if they lost, the other nation would come back to Rome and they would destroy it. And to that, to that nation, everyone is an enemy, whether they're a soldier or a farmer. But for the soldier going out, it's a whole different experience. He goes out, he has to go out leaving Rome, knowing that this could be the last time that he sees his home, that he sees his family. He goes out knowing that he maybe might come back, but come back without an arm or without an eye or without a leg. Faces that danger. But as, as the Romans would, would, would come back in, in victory, they would come back and they would be welcomed by this parade. People rejoicing. And they would be in the middle of this parade. And I, I'm sure all of them would walk in with this pride. Some of them may be limping. Some of them have lost an eye. Some of them can, can, can barely walk through. Some of them are struggling to breathe. But they come in with this pride knowing we fought the good fight. And that victory means something different for him than for the farmer who's maybe part of the parade welcoming them in. They're both victorious. And, and as believers, whether we participate with God's plan or not, we are still saved. Our salvation is not based on our works. But, but I think about getting to heaven and how bad it would feel to enter heaven knowing that I didn't really do all that much. I just kind of sat around and waited till the time I would go to meet Jesus. I, I want to walk in and have this, this picture of, of being bruised and, and battered and wounded, but walking in and God saying to me, well done, good and faithful servant. He says to us, be strong and courageous. Because I am with you. There's a, there's a, there's a beauty that comes from, from suffering like Jesus suffered. 
As if, if any of you have ever tried to share the gospel or be Christ-like and then be insulted for it or persecuted for, for it, you feel bad in that moment, but then you feel this closeness to God. You feel this fellowship with Christ that you wouldn't have felt otherwise. So there's such a, a, there's a far greater benefit of suffering for Christ and fighting for Christ than just kind of waiting for stuff to happen. So like Joshua, we are, we are being called to, to, to a dangerous life, one of serving him, one of following him in everything that we do. And it's scary because everything is against us. We've stepped out onto the battlefield. We have proclaimed that we are standing for Christ and the enemy is coming against us. And the whole world is coming against us. But he says, be strong and courageous. But how do we do this practically? In um, chapter, uh, verse 7 of chapter 1 of Joshua, he says, be strong and courageous. Be careful to obey the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. He's saying, pour over it. Go to his word. Read it. Find out. Because in his word, we find out a number of things. We find out who God is, first of all. And when we know who he is, we will trust him. We'll find out that he's loving. We'll find out that he's faithful. We'll find out that he'll give us the words to speak when we're standing in front of people and God has called us to speak. We'll find out that God is the one who will give us love when we need to love our enemies. We'll find out that he's the one who will give us grace when people have, have, have hurt us and, and don't deserve our love. Because who of us actually does? We'll find out all these things, but we'll also find out what God is calling us to do, how we're supposed to live. And in that, then we can go in confidence. So the first thing is, we need to seek, search his word and find, find out who he is. And in his word, find out what he's calling us to do. But that means that we spend time with him personally, daily. Do you ever find that, that a day that you haven't spent time with God, you're not as patient? Right? You, you don't, you're not as compelled to do the things that God has called you to do. When I'm not spending time in God's word, I spend weeks without thinking about someone that I know that doesn't believe in Christ. And I'm not bothered by it. It's as we spend time with him that, that he changes us, that he pulls our heart towards him and to the things he wants us to do, the ways he wants us to live. So we need to spend time with him. We need to, to, to get into his word. Even if it's bit by bit, even if you're reading a couple of verses a day, but going to the Bible and saying, God, I need your truth. I cannot do this on my own. So we need to, we need to read, we need to spend time with him, we need to be praying. Then he says, and keep, and keep this law on your lips, meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do, to do everything in it. So, very simple, actually. Find out what God is calling us to do and who he is, and then do it. That's what he's calling us to do. And then there's a reminder always. At the end of this, he reminds Joshua once again. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. So as a, as a church this morning, let's, let's commit to that, to spending time in his word, to know what, what, who he is, to remind ourselves of, of his faithfulness as we go out into this world doing the things that he has called us to do. And let's actually make a plan to do, to do what he's called us to do. Every time I sit down and I read my Bible and I don't have a, a pen and paper and write down a plan, that thing, I'll miss it completely. I'll forget about it. I'll go about my day and have no intention to obey. It needs to be intentional. Our lives will be changed dramatically if you, even if you just read one verse. Find out what God is calling you to do and focus on doing that that day. That will change you. 
that will shape you. So for those who, who don't know Jesus, Jesus is saying to you today, I died on the cross and paid for your sins and made a way for you to have full access to the Father, that every sin is forgiven, the ones from before and the ones that you will still commit, that there's no, that there's no action, there's no feeling, there's no person that can take us out of his love once we've committed to him. If you don't know Jesus, Jesus is saying to you, won't you come to me? Won't you come and see how good I am? If you'd like to make that decision today, please do speak to me or or maybe another person that you know here that's a believer. Ask them, them, how do I do this? How do I start this relationship with Jesus? If you're a believer today who has just kind of been relaxed and kind of maybe followed a dad or a mom or a friend followed someone here at church and don't have your own personal pursuit why not start today this is the time this is the day this is the day that God is calling you walk with me I have a mission for you like I had a mission for the disciples and for Joshua and for Moses I have a mission for you but you need to spend time with me so, so you can figure it out, so I can show you. God has called every single one of us. And I'll say this, if we are bored with our walk with Christ, it's probably because we're not pursuing him. For the believers that are pursuing, those who are trying to do that day after day, individually pursuing God, we are called to encourage those who are not. We are called to encourage family members, friends, people at work who know Jesus but are not pursuing him. We are called to, to, to encourage them, called to pull them aside and say, no, 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 we're a team, but you also, you also need to be good at what God is calling you to do. You need to develop in that. You need to grow in that. Let's do this together. So as, as, as a church, wherever we are, let's pray and do business with God. Say, God, you know where I am. You know where I need to be. Let's go there together. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you so much. Thank you for for your word. The words that come from you that that are perfect in every way. Thank you for the way that you disclose who you are to us. That as we read your word, we find out about your love, your, your kindness, your, your grace, how just you are. And we thank you, Jesus, that you have made a way for us to have direct access to you. So God, why would we not? God, I pray that we wouldn't miss out on an opportunity to, to commune with you, to know you. And God, you're calling each and every one of us. You've given every one of us purpose. We have a collective purpose as a a church to glorify you, but every single one of us in the different places that we are at have an individual mission to glorify you there. So God, I pray, as Joshua went forward, I pray that we would step out as well, trusting what you said, stepping out, being strong, and courageous, because you are with us always. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.